I'm going to invite my friend MK to come up. You guys put your hands together for MK. Thank you, MK. You can grab your microphone. All right, so MK is going to come and join me on the screen here, on the screen, on the, on the platform here. Um, and then um, I'm just going to ask him some questions today. I'm, uh, I'm going to give you guys the chance to get to know him and his family and, and uh, just hear what, hear what God is doing in India. Is that, is that okay? All right, put your hands together for MK and his wife, Poonam. Okay, MK, welcome, welcome. How are you doing? You okay? Uh, Go ahead. Yes. I am doing uh, really well. Very good, very good. Uh, hey, so please introduce yourself. Um, your, your full name is quite fun to say, so, so give us that and, uh, and where you're from, uh, yeah. where you grew up. Well, my name is uh, Mrityunse Kumar Bharati. And, uh, There's going to be a test at the yes. end. Yes. Okay. Uh, so it's you easy be able to, to say MK, okay? <laughs> MK. <laughs> yeah. I am from Northern India, a state called Bihar. Yeah. Yeah. And so tell us um, how you grew up, um, what, what, what it looked like kind of growing up, and then how, how did you come to meet Jesus? Well, uh, uh, it's, it's really a very big story. So Give it to will, us. That's yeah, why we're here. I will, I, will, I will try to summarize. And uh, uh, 23 years ago, uh, I was part of Hindu fanatics family. Uh, uh, you know, in our family, uh, we had a strong traditions and we were like uh, worshipping many, many idols and uh, even we sacrificed like each year uh, many animals mm. to please uh, uh, all those goddesses. Uh, you know, my father was the youngest one in my big generation. So a lot of, uh, you know, ritual responsibility on him mm. and uh, you know so each year we have to to uh, sacrifice animals and worship all these goddesses uh, we are three brother uh, so i am the youngest one uh, in my family as well as in my big generation and i was like always you know uh, thinking you know why we are just like killing all these animals and throwing the bloods on all those idols. Mm. And we were doing uh, to have peace and prosperity. Uh, but uh, it was always, always, you know, fighting, always tension uh, was, you know, just in our family, in our, you know, uh, generation. Mm. And it was so hard to go. Uh, you know, I realized that uh, sometime like my father will go and borrow money and buy all these animals mm. and to do all these rituals. And even he was not able to pay our tuition fees for our school. Mm. And so it was so, so tough. Uh, uh, you know, in 2001, my middle brother, uh, he got uh, very much sick. Uh, so, you know, we tried everything. Uh, we took him to the big hospitals and uh, many, many temples. We invite many witch doctors to come and perform all kinds of uh, uh, you know, Hindu rituals, mm -hmm. the dark magic. Uh, we tried all kinds of things uh, to get healing because my middle brother was special uh, in our family. Mm. Uh, he was the first one that he went to college uh, to be graduate. Mm. And my family and my you know, uncles were just thinking that he is the one that he will bring, uh, you know, a lot of prosperity in our family when he will get a big officer mm -hmm. or become big officer like that. And, but he was sick, tried everything. He was, uh, you know, just like on the bed and we were just waiting that he would be die today, tomorrow like mm -hmm. that. And there was no hope. We lost the hope. And just we were waiting. Many relatives started to come and visit him. And, uh, but God has some different plan. Mm. You know, two uh, evangelists, they came uh, to our village, uh, you know, to, to share about Jesus, to distribute the, you know, New Testament and gospel tract. And uh, they were doing, you know, and hundreds of people were there. And, uh, you know, to receive all those books or gospel tract. And I went over there uh, with a with a it's like a fighting spirit because I was like that time uh, 17 18 year old and uh, 
uh, full of uh, energy, mm. you know, and uh, I hate Christianity uh, those time because uh, uh, we were very strong worshipper of many uh, idols and our Hindu priests, they told us that Christians are very bad mm. uh, because we worship uh, cow is like our holy mother, we drink the milk and, uh, you know, they were, means Hindu priests were, they were telling us that they are the one, they are very bad because they ate our God. Mm. And so that was like, you know, really, really strong, uh, you know, things in my heart that I do not want to see any Christians in my area. I feel that time I was a Hindu strong radical mm. and I do not want to see that. And uh, uh, it was so uh, struggle. And I went over there, uh, you know, and I started to shout. Uh, I said, hey, go, go from my village. Mm. Uh, there is no, uh, you know, God who are living. You know, all gods are fake. Because since six months, we were trying healing for our brother. And he was about to die. And uh, so I was like shouting over there like a crazy young man. Mm. And they just stopped their open air preaching. And... Uh, uh, you know, people started to go back their uh, houses. And after one hour, they came to my house and they said, Hey, we heard that your brother is dying and we are here to pray for him. Mm. And I said, I don't need prayer. Go from here. He's dying. He will be dying maybe tomorrow or today. Mm. And they said, you guys tried everything. We will just pray freely. We will not charge any money because the tradition talks about any priest comes to the houses we have to feed them or we have to give some money. Mm. So we had nothing. We lost everything. We were poor and we become poorest. And uh, barely we were surviving. And uh, they said, we will, you know, just pray and then go. So they entered and they kneeled down. They started to sing some chorus. And uh, just they were continue praying, asking God. Tears were just going on. And I don't know, something happened. Uh, I was just standing over, over there and, and I begin to cry. I feel the touch of God. I feel uh, that Jesus is, you know, uh, telling me that I am your real God, mm. that you are searching, something like that. For the first time, experience in my life like mm. this. So they finished their prayer and they said, hey, you are going to pray for your brother. And I don't know. Uh, I, I told them, I don't know how to pray. And they said, you will be praying. So they left, they never returned back. And because of that touch of God, uh, I feel something that, you know, looks like still God is there. Mm. And uh, so I started to go to Riverside alone, hidden place. Mm. Uh, and I started to raise my hand because I do not want to pray in my house. Because in India, like, you know, people li live very closely, you know, <laughs> here, here, here. And if you are even fighting in your home, in your room, others are listening. <laughs> so because of that, I started to go in hidden place. I do not want to let or hear anybody. Or maybe they will be thinking his brother is dying and this guy also become mentally, like, disturbed, mm. you know. So like these things. And I don't know how to pray, but I begin to pray like this. I said, God, I know you are real God because you are the one who has spoken to my heart. Mm. If you are real or if you heal my brother, I will give my life to you. So my prayer was a conditional prayer. Yeah. Okay. Let me tell all of you, God loves the conditional <laughs> prayer. <laughs> and uh, he... Uh, you know, uh, started to do some tremendous work. You know, my brother was not drinking or eating anything and he started to drink. So I said, okay, God is working. And then my prayer time was even more and more. And, uh, you know, within a month, uh, you know, he just started to eat, drink, started to stand by himself, started to walk. And I was keep telling him, don't die. Jesus is healing you. And uh, so uh, this is how brother, uh, my brother got healed. And uh, I gave my life to serve wow. to Jesus. Come on, put your hands together. Yeah. That's amazing, huh? 
That's so, that's so wonderful. Uh, MK said that he was a he was a young, you know, kind of passionate man on the front end, uh, and with lots of energy. But I just want you to know he still has it. We took him to Estes Park yesterday, and my man caught a chipmunk with his bare hands. Okay, so like I just want you to know he still got it. I, I've never seen anybody catch a chipmunk in Estes Park. I got a picture. If you want to see it, I'll show you. Anyway, sorry. Side note. Um, hey, that is incredible, is it not, guys? So God healed his brother, and, and not just you become a follower of Jesus, but your brother begins to follow Jesus as well? Yeah, you know, my same brother, he also has given his life because uh, when Brother Manoj was healed, uh, I, you know, just become so much happy in my heart. And I started to tell that, you know, we need to worship Jesus. We need to throw all these goddesses like, you know, the idols, the photos were there in our house and you know, arguing with my father. And that time I was selected to be uh, as an Indian army. You know, I run and many, many young people are dying to get this job. And I was selected, uh, you know, to, to go and join. And my father said, you know, it is better for you to go and join and make money so that we will survive. And I said, no, I am, I am going to be army for Jesus. And, and so, uh, my father uh, got really upset, you know, he just, he said, man, you are not listening and being a youngest one in the family, not listening. Father, I was kicked out. Very big story. I end up into a Bible school 200 kilometers away. When I finished my Bible school, I returned back. My same brother, he said, your God is powerful. I will also give my life to him. Wow. He gave his life to Christ. I discipled him. We start a church in our family, you know, people started to come and he was going village after village and telling that Jesus is the one who healed me. I was dying, you all know, and people started to come to know. And, uh, you know, this is how from 2003 to 2009, he brought over four or five thousand people to Christ, planted over over hundreds of house churches, like 20 people, 30 people in a village yeah. worshiping Christ. And I was learning all the, you know, teaching, training, uh, administration things in the city where I was uh, doing my Bible school. Mm -hmm. They selected me uh, as a staff over there. So I was working in the city. My brother was uh, leading people to Christ. Wow. So not only me, from 2003 to 2009, over 400 family members, and I'm including all our close relatives, like from uh, from our, you know, like father's side, from my mother's side, from our wife, like we are three brothers, so they're, uh, you know, my means our in-laws, families, mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of close relatives, they came to Christ, and uh, many of them, they become uh, church planters and wow. pastors. Wow. So this is how God has worked in our family. Come on, put your hands together. That's amazing. I know sometimes there's a cultural gap, right? If you haven't been on the ground, and you know, so, so there's like images in my mind as he's talking that you might not have. And so uh, as you put the pieces together, right? MK comes from, um, there's a caste system in India. So it comes from a very poor background. And, um, and in addition to that, like as he's talking about people choosing to follow Jesus, um, it's very different in, in his context versus ours. A lot of people in the West, because of the individualism that we carry, if you choose to follow Jesus, your, your family, very few people experience like a disassociation or a rejection as a result of following Jesus in the West. Your family might not like jump up and down for you if you make that decision, but it's largely like, oh yeah, you do you. Whereas people making the decision to follow Jesus in this context is a really, really big deal. Uh, when Jesus talks about like picking up your cross and following me and dying to yourself, like there's a really large cost to following Jesus uh, for, for individuals in the context of, of these Hindu families. And so um, I want to fast forward for a moment. Uh, tell us, catch us up, because not, not everyone knows in the room. So since 2010, what, what all has, have you, have you seen God do? And, and I want you guys to know, MK is like just like you and me. Um, Jesus changed his life. Uh, he wasn't even necessarily looking for Jesus, but then because of what God has done, uh, he just began to open up his life as well as others to what God was doing. And so now they're in the middle of, of what's, what's often known as a move of God. And, it, and, and you're going to understand why in a moment. But MK, will you just tell us, so starting in 2010, what happened? And then what has God been doing since then? And what is he doing now in India? Well, 
you know, uh, where we were working, uh, that organization were turning into be, uh, to be denomination and people started to mag and uh, we uh, quit working over there. And uh, I begin to pray, I said, God, what's your plan uh, for my life? Hmm. So me. I want to reach thousands and millions of people for your kingdom. Hmm. And I don't know how to do that. Uh, you know, me and my wife and our two little kids, uh, you know, in 2009, in the month of December, we quit working over there. You know, nothing was there. Living in the metro city it was very tough to pay even house rent. And we were expecting our third baby. It was so a struggle time for three months, uh, you know, uh, you know, like I was not able to provide even the healthy food to my wife and uh, there was no money to take my wife to hospital so she mm. can birth our third baby. Mm. It was so uh, terrible. I came to the point uh, uh, to, you know, just, you know, to quit ministry and, and, and do uh, labor work so that I can, you know, feed my family. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, but God did miracle, you know, our third baby son, you know, he was uh, birthed in our, fa in our, in our home and no medicine. Wow. He was healthy. And then after that, you know, uh, someone came to stand with me and they said, man, we know that you are talking about reaching thousands of people and bringing, you know, uh, many, many, and you're trying to plant thousands of churches. So we are with you. Yeah. And they started to support and the ministry begins from, uh, you know, from one family, you know, we become 10 family. And now we are 1100 full time church planters working all over northern India and planted over 40,000 house churches and <laughs> brought over 2 million people to become followers of Jesus. Come on, put your hands together. Yeah. <laughs> Did you, did you guys hear how he casually jumped from one to 10 to 40,000? Like, yeah. anybody else catch that? That's, it's incredible, right? You, you know what's really hard um, is those numbers are really easy to say, but, but it is such a large area of work, right? I mean, I mean to, to actually see that many people, 40,000 house churches and 2 million people choosing to follow Jesus, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine, is it not? Um, and, and it might sound like from where we're sitting, we're like, wow, <laughs> go MK. But what does that have to do with us, right? Like, how, like it's so far removed, right? So mm. when, you, when you look at what God has done over the last 10 years, um, what, what is he doing now? Like, so so that's, that's been the last decade, but, mm. but what, what's, what's happening right now and, and what do you see next? You know, uh, of course, uh, you know, for all of you to hear all these numbers is like, you know, uh, looks like doubting, you know, mm -hmm. maybe he's talking in the air, but uh, uh, brother, you know, uh, Drake has been there and a couple of people uh, been there and they have seen those churches meet with, you know, hundreds of people, thousands of people. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is there, but I'm, you know, just think about like, uh, over 650 million people, they live in the size of Texas land. Okay? Ooh. And uh, City of Sturt, a powerful missionary, you know, from England. He brought thousands of people to Christ. He was a professional cricket player, uh, you know, and, and he gave everything to God. And he said like this, someone wants to build their house a leave uh, nearby chapel, you know, nearby church to live in the peace. But he said, I want to open a rescue shop at the yard of hell. Each second, people are dying. And they are going hell because they don't know Jesus. Mm. They have not heard about Jesus. So our life is all about that. Mm. And I have been challenging all my co-workers to even not sleep pretty much, just work hard for God because we are the one that we can stop them, uh, you know, at the yard of hell and send them 
to heaven. Mm. And uh, we are doing tremendous work, you know, uh, by 2033, we're looking forward to plant a healthy church in all the, the villages of northern India. Mm. And still over 200,000 villages are remain. 200,000 villages are remain. And our goal is to do that. Why 2033? If calendar is right, 2033. 33 will be counted 2,000 years of Great Commission. Mm. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's like challenging to hear. But 2033 will be counted 2,000 years of Great Commission. So we want to celebrate 2,000 years of Great Commission by planting a healthy church in all the villages of northern India. Come and on. this is possible because I am not doing. God himself is the one who is doing. Yeah. And everything possible with him. Yes. Yeah. Come on. Put yeah. your hands together. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so so uh, w w what they're calling um, this effort is, is no village left. Um, and so the desire is to reach, you said 200,000 more villages, right? Planting mm -hmm. churches. Um, so do, do you guys hear how calm he talks about that? <laughs> I mean, I, what I love about spending time with MK is his, his confidence in who God says that he is and what he says he will do. Um, I asked him yesterday, I said, hey, what's the biggest challenge in, in making disciples uh, in India? You know, like from your perspective, what's the hardest part about introducing people to Jesus? And he looked at me and he said, it's not challenging. <laughs> I was like, MK, that's not the answer I was looking for. Right? He said, the hardest part is having a, a, enough funds to send out the church planters that they have. I'm like, man, that's awesome. Uh, so I, I hope that you're inspired, um, but I want to ask a few more questions um, in order to understand kind of not only how our church can partner with uh, MK and the Friends of India Network in this area uh, to be a part of what God is doing there, um, but in addition, um, how we can consider what God is doing here uh, through our church. So MK, um, how are some ways that, that we can pray and pa like partner with you guys through prayer as a, as a church? Well, uh, I would uh, love... Uh, to share, you know, a lot of prayer requests, but I can just say that, hey, uh, you know, uh, please be continue praying for uh, Northern India. Northern India is one of the largest unreached place in this planet, largest. Think about Habakkuk 2.14 talks about one day the earth will be filled with his glory of the knowledge as waters covers the sea. Hmm. So himself, he wants to fill all the the planet, all the people with his knowledge, with the God's knowledge. Think about Revelation 7, 9 talks about one day a multitude numbers will be standing before God to worship him. Mm. And they all will be counted from every nation, from every language, yeah. from tongues and tribe, all kinds of people will be gathering. And it's very powerful things written there that no one will be able to count that number hmm. the calculator will be collapsed <laughs> Let's go. to count that number and this is what god wants to see so when you pray god works hmm. more prayer more works hmm. and you know like a city church even one minute you guys pray for india god is working wow so please be continue praying. Yeah, thank you. You know, it's the first generation of Christians and our area uh, is like known as a graveyard of missions, uh, less than 1% Christian. So uh, people are learning uh, to give and uh, we want to do more and more. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but that is not enough. Thousands of people are in waiting list to have an opportunity to become church planters, to become pastors. Mm -hmm. And we are not able to even support them. Mm -hmm. So pray, give whatever you can. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I strongly believe that is going to bless India, bless all of you, and mm -hmm. uh, is going to multiply the work what we are doing. Yeah, praise God yeah. for that. Thank you. Um, he, he mentioned something just a second ago. He said that this area in northern India is less than 1% Christian. 
Um, it's known as, as the church plant or the church planting graveyard in India. Uh, for those of you that have been around for a minute, our city uh, here in Boulder is known as the church planting graveyard here in Colorado. Um, and so, so we we look at what God has done here. And we're blown away, right? For, for City Church still to be here, for us to be self-sustaining, to have the, even the ability to consider a building, for example, to see all the people that have come to follow Jesus as we continue to pray more and more to, to introduce people to the love of God. Um, it's inspiring to see that in the middle of uh, the missionary graveyard, mm. God is bringing life out of death, right? And, and God wants to do the same thing in this city, in our lives, through our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. Uh, what I want you to hear from, India, uh, from, from MK as he was sharing um, what, what they have right now, um, they're doing some incredible things. So, so uh, when a church planter go, go, goes out, they'll have, is it five or 15 villages that they, they focus on? Yeah, a, a church a planter, uh, you know, we are equipping, uh, especially the indigenous uh, people, yeah. local people, and the structure of India talks about, you know, the nation, state, district, block, and panchayat. Panchayat is like a 15, 12, 15 villages, mm -hmm. around 20, 30,000 people in circle two, three kilometer. So my prayer, God help us so that we can train and equip full-time church planter, one for poor church uh, panchayat, yeah. so that they can uh, plant churches. In five years, they can plant easily 15 church, they can baptize over 500 people, and they can lead over 1,500 people to Christ. Okay. Yeah. Sounds great. So, in five years, they can easily plant 15 churches. And in five years, we can almost plant one. Let's go. Um, hey, what, what I want you to hear, though, is so, so um, what, what they do is they train up these church planters. So, so they just, you just did a push week, right, where they sent yeah. out. How many teams, how, how many people went out? Well, uh, last week of June uh, is, is the hottest week of the year consider uh, in northern India, uh, maybe around 125. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So many people, they are just like in their grass houses in the rural villages, under tree, playing cards, you know, nobody works in the field. And so we send over 3,700 teams, two by two, with the gospel banner, and they put on the wall, you know, somebody is holding and sharing the story of Jesus, and we reach over 4.5 million people in one week. In June, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Put your hands together. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Do you guys hear how, how, um, how there's this unique combination of faith, of trusting God, and also just really intentional, like, simple living? So they chose a week when people are trying not to be in the sun and die. And so they're, they're hanging out inside. And so then, can, can you imagine, like, if we were talking, hey, City Church, we're going to go out and we're going to go love and serve our city. Let's pick the hottest day of the year, right? That's literally what his teams are doing in order to serve people well. And then they go out and, and within a week share. So out of that, they have a, a bunch of people come to follow Jesus. Oh, yeah. And then they have uh, these leaders that begin to look at all of these new believers and as they take steps in baptism and things like that, they start to identify the potential church planters in those circles, right? That's right. Okay, so currently what I want you guys to know is they have 4,000 church mm -hmm. planters that, that are getting ready to be trained to go out in, 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 into different areas. Is that right? That's right. You know, uh, we do have a church planting training, and we want to train the disciple to become church planter for 15 months. So five days into the class and three months into the field. So whatever they have learned into the class, they have to do. If they have done, then they have to come again. So it's like an obedience-based uh, training. And 4,000 uh, disciple maker has been selected to be church planter. And uh, now they have to go through training mm -hmm. and so that they can become full-time uh, church planters. Yeah, so, so this training equips them to go out into that panchayat mm -hmm. and to reach these 15 villages. That's right. And once they reach those 15 villages, then that church planter becomes self-sustaining, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, so as far as how they're funding, it's not like just indefinite way of funding. What they do is they bring them together. They'll train 35 to 40 church planters at a time. Yeah. And, and it's over the course of, was it 15 months? 15 months. So 15 months, they'll train. And did you hear how he said they'll train them for a minute and then they send them out and they have to go do the stuff, right? Does that sound familiar to you? 
right? We talk a lot about how, how in the West, right, sometimes we can be like information saturated and obedience deficient, right? So they give them something and they say, go do it. And only if they go do it, do they come back. Like if we actually practice the way of Jesus, right? So they're really paying attention to that. Um, but over 15 months, they'll train them. And it costs roughly, is it $5,000 to, tr- to do that entire training over 15 months? Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, they've currently got things like uh, MK's and his team, and they're doing such good jobs. Um, they've started fish farms in order to help fund these church planters, right? Because if they're not funded, then all of these guys have to work full-time, like day labor jobs. Mm-hmm. And then also try to still go do it, which by the way, they still do, right? Yeah. So FYI, they don't let the fact that they have to work full-time, like hard, like uh, day labor jobs, keep them from planting churches. They can just do it more quickly and more efficiently. Um, and so they've started a fish farm in order to begin to fund church planters. They're starting a dairy farm in order to, st- to fund, uh, fund church planters. And they're, they're getting ready to start a water plant to fund church planters. Isn't that amazing? That's like, that's like really awesome work all just so people can know Jesus. And so what I want you to know is as we partner with them through prayer, as we all, so when you give to City Church, we already partner with them financially. Our desire is to do that more and more. Uh, also, the opportunity always is if God speaks to you directly and he wants you to partner with them directly, you don't have to go through City Church, right? You can just have a relationship uh, with what God is doing there. Um, but uh, w- with their efforts currently, they've covered about 10% of, of the, the budget needed to train those 4,000 church planters. Um, and so then one of the things that we have the privilege of doing as a church and also while he's here in the West is connecting him with more and more, more relationships to help cover the, the 90 percent. They have all these church planters that are ready to go and just not mm-hmm. the funds necessary. You got to consider, right, they're planting in areas that are very poor, right? That's right? So while they're teaching people to be generous, it's a very, very poor area. And so the ability to raise funds quickly is not is not the same as what we can do here. And so one of our privileges, right, we talk about it. You don't just give to a church, you give through a church. And so we're constantly looking, our board, our team, our leaders, how do we continue to partner with them on the other side of the world to be a part of what God is doing? But I want you to have an understanding of, of how God is working there and how we can partner. So, so we can pray with them. You can par- partner with them financially. Uh, what else can we do uh, to come alongside you guys? Yeah, uh, please come uh, to see what God is doing over there, you know, once a year. 10, 20 people, and, and just, I, I, I know that uh, uh, when you come, you will be more uh, feeling yourself very close to God, mm. uh, even whatever the things you are doing. So uh, please come and, and, and see. Yes. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, you know, we have, uh, uh, it's called a disciple maker school uh, where the younger generations are mm. uh, coming over there for six months. Mm-hmm. So we are training and equipping them. Uh, they work up uh, 5 a.m. every morning and they pray. So they will be praying for city church. Mm-hmm. We have over 150 orphans, uh, you know, uh, fatherless and motherless, you know, and they also work up 5 a.m. and they prayed. And uh, uh, so we will be continue praying for all of you. Uh, we will never forget. We are praying for uh, Pastor Greg and for his family. So continue, uh, we'll be praying because I came from an untouchable background. So I brought all these wonderful opportunity, uh, you know, for all these untouchables, poorest of the poor, children, younger generation, so that they can become a strong mm. and be uh, the leader to lead the nation. Mm-hmm. For example, my same brother, uh, you know, uh, who got healed, he was pastor. And now, uh, this year, in the month of uh, June, on 4th June, uh, he won the election and he became the member of parliament. Isn't that crazy? So, same brother. His brother became a member of parliament and won the yeah. election in June. Po- very powerful things, you know. My wife, she also has been elected and become a district council member, uh, a chairman uh, for her district, mm-hmm. like four million people. And she's a powerful. And so in that area, God is uh, doing tremendous work, yeah. not only you know transforming uh, spiritually, but socially, uh, because we are the people of God. We don't bribe, you know, we, we just do the judgment very honest way and Mm -hmm. and this is what we are doing yeah so this is how god has blessed me and our ministry yeah come on man it's amazing (laughs) isn't it guys can you put your hands together for all that god's doing 
when we're in India, uh, we, we jump in different cars and run around, and uh, Poonam's like not messing around, man. She's got guards and security cars, lights on top. I feel safe with her, okay? <laughs> um, uh, so so she, he had to bring his boss with him on this trip. That's what's going on there. Um, uh, it's, it's incredible. And so, yeah. uh, so uh, we told you a little bit, but the persecution is pretty high. Uh, oh, yeah. And so as you pray, right, we're praying for no village left. Uh, we're praying for their workers. We're praying for the funds to be gathered. We're praying for the 4,000 church planters trained. We're praying uh, for all the disciples being made. Uh, but we're also praying uh, because of the persecution in that area. Um, um, that, that there are radicals that, that, that cause some problems, MK was saying, um, in different ways. But it's kind of a short-term issue. He said the bigger mm-hmm. issue is the government. Yeah. Um, there's, 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 uh, uh, even right now you can pray for him that there's an investigation going on over, over him as an individual and all their organizations. They do a, a tremendous amount of good, um, but there's quite a bit of heavy persecution uh, and threat to go to jail, things like that consistently. Um, and so God's favor of his brother getting elected is a pretty big deal. And so they're mm-hmm. praying for that to begin to change the, the climate. Um, and so if, if there's favor in the government, it opens up more and more opportunity to see no village left. Uh, but we also see in the book of Acts that the church thrives in the middle of persecution, right? Um, and so what's amazing is, is what God is doing in the middle of hard times. Um, and so I, w- I want you guys just to know this family. I want you to know their faces and their names. And, and so then when we pray for them, you know, we'll have a, a, a 24-7 prayer room um, in, in the fall where we do nonstop prayer for an entire week. And part of that prayer is, is praying on behalf of all our partners around the world. And, and I want you to have faces and names and know how to p- begin to pray and partner with them. If you have the ability, it's expensive. It's, it's, it's quite the investment to go uh, and, and be in India. Um, I recommend not going in June. Um, it is quite hot. Um, but honestly, we took a, a crew of guys in June this year. Um, it was just the, the only time that we could make it work. Um, and I don't think anybody on that trip would say it was, it was not worth it. Even in the middle of it, I would do it again. But it wasn't, I mean, it was, it was incredible. It was incredible. And so um, as we wrap up our time, uh, we're, we're going to pray for them as a church. Um, and then uh, you're going to have some time. You can meet them after the service and things like that as well. Um, and then and if we can connect you more with their network and things like that, we're glad to. Um, but again, guys, when, when you give to City Church, it, it allows us to partner uh, with, with, with people just like, like MK and his wife and, and their team and many others around the world. Uh, MK, is there anything else that you would like to say uh, to our church or share with them uh, before we pray for you guys? Yeah, don't pray to stop the persecution uh, over in India. Just pray for the first generation of believers to be more bold to face the persecution. Mm. Because persecution is from the beginning, okay? Mm. So it is part of our life all mm. the time. So just pray so that all these people, they can face the persecution. I've been more than 40 times to police stations, and they are asking same question hundreds of times. And they ask, you know, why you are converting people? I said, I don't convert. I just share the story of Jesus. And Jesus has done some tremendous work. Mm. So I, I do not have power to convert. Mm. So this is how they close my file, but... You know, six months ago, they again open mm. and they're trying to find something so that they can put me in jail. But pray that we will get more boldness to, to face the persecution. Come on. Yeah. Praise God. Put your hands together. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you to take a seat for just a moment um, uh, over here with your wife. And then we're going to pray for you. Uh, I want to share with you just for a moment as we wrap up our time. I'm going to invite Daniel to come as well. Uh, can you put your hands together one more time for MK and his wife being here? Really, really grateful um, for, for the space. I just want to take a moment as we wrap up our time and before we pray for them and before we respond um, to give you some context um, to, to today's conversation. Um, if you're a part of City Church, if you're a follower of Jesus, I hope this is inspiring to you. I hope it's helpful for you. Um, if, if you're not a follower of Jesus or you've kind of been around the church, you're wrestling with faith, you're trying to figure out like wh- where you are in relationship to Jesus. And, uh, you know, maybe you hear conversations like this and you're super inspired. Uh, or maybe you hear conversations like this and you're super intimidated. Or, or maybe maybe there's just a little bit of lethargy, right? Like you hear that and you're like, oh, that's great for them. But, but your heart doesn't swell and stir for a little more. Like it's totally fine. I think w- one of the things that we try really hard to work on here Um, is leaning into Jesus' invitation. When he calls us to repent, it literally means to consider where my mind is, consider the reality, the truth of God, and then to align myself with that reality. Uh, uh, Jamie Winship calls repentance truth-telling. 
is just being honest about where I am. And there's many times over the course of this weekend, spending time with MK, where I've had the chance to repent. And, and, it, and it can be a, a deep broken heart. It can be on my knees. There's absolutely a place for, for deep spaces of repentance. But there's also just honest moments. When, when I look at what God is doing in his life and, and, and I realize the gaps in mine. God, I, I, don't, I don't want that. Like, I want to want that. Have you ever been there? God, I don't want you like I want to want you. Or God, uh, my, my life is so busy and distracted and full of things that don't matter that I haven't even had time to consider that. Not only what you're doing around the world, but what you're doing right in front of me. And so, so I don't know where you are on your spiritual journey, whether you're a follower of Jesus or you're considering things, but I want to give you the parable from Jesus that Daniel read just a moment ago in Luke chapter 15. Kyle, can you throw that back up on the screen? Do you have that? If not, I can just read it. Luke chapter 15. This is the parable uh, from Jesus Oh yeah, sorry, I'm messing your life up. Thank you. This is not planned, but I got to give it to you, okay? Listen, listen to Jesus' words. I want you to listen to this. Jesus is surrounded by crowds. He's got tax collectors and sinners. That's the language Luke uses around him. And, and these are people that are far from God. Everyone knows they're far from God. They know they're far from God. Um, you know, as MK used the language of untouchables. And so these are, are, are clearly people who have no life in alignment with the way of Jesus. And yet they are flocking to him. They can't, they, they are so drawn to him. And in that same crowd are these groups of Pharisees, that these people, the religious leaders of the day uh, uh, that, that think that they have it all together. And so when, and they're actually criticizing Jesus in the middle of this, that all these people would be around him, that he eats with them, that he shares a table with them. And then Jesus tells this parable, this story, in light of that posture in the crowd around him. And I just want you to hear these words, and I want you to hear these words first for yourself, because this is God's heart for you. And then I want you to hear this for others, because this is God's heart for the people where we live, work, and play. This is God's heart for the city of Boulder, Colorado, and this is God's heart for every village in northern India. Jesus says this, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after that lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. And he doesn't stop there. He calls his friends, his neighbors together, and he says, Rejoice with me. Celebrate with me. I have found my lost sheep. And then he goes on. And he says, In the same manner, God and the angels rejoice in heaven over one sinner who repents, over one person who is far from God, who recognizes the gap and chooses to turn and trust in Jesus, to find life in Jesus now and forever. Last time, I don't know very many sheep farmers here. So, so our, our hearts might not immediately connect, but I don't know about you, but when I look at that, so you, you got 100 and you lose one, and you're in the middle of nowhere and you're going to leave the 99 to go find the one, are you sure? You got like 99 more. There's bears and lions and tigers and stuff, right? Oh my. I mean, you, you look at that and you're like, oh, wow, really? No, we're going to leave the 99. What does he do? Through everything it takes, he goes to find the one. And then Jesus follows it up and he tells a story about a woman who loses a coin, a, a coin, a quarter. My kids get these little dollar coins when the, never mind. <laughs> um, they get these little dollar, you know, those gold, gold dollar coins. Imagine you lost a dollar coin. There's this lady that flips her entire house upside down to find it. Is that worth your energy and your time? The point is it kind of seems small. It kind of seems silly. It kind of seems like a lot of effort for something not very significant. And then right after that, Jesus shares the parable of, of the father whose son runs away and just wastes his entire inheritance on, on the life of all the things he's trying to get to fill up his life. And he runs out of everything and, he, and he's eating with the pigs and then he, he just drags himself back to his father's house because he's like, at least I won't starve to death there, even if I'm only a servant. And as this son walks back to his father's house, it says the father is on the doorstep. He's leaning out. He's looking for this son. And then when he sees him far off, he leaves the house. He runs to him. He embraces him. And, and he says, this is my son that's been lost. He was dead and now he's alive. 
And Jesus' heart here is to communicate God's love for you, to leave the 99 for the one, to step out of heaven, to come to earth, to live a perfect life that you and I can't live, to die a death on a cross that we deserve to be buried and rise again so that we can have forgiveness of sin and new life. We can know God as Father, live in relationship with Him. And it's not just for you and me, it's for the world. And I wonder if you would just let the posture of God's heart for you stir you this morning. Whether you've been following Jesus for a long time, would you let it sink in one more time? I'm the one. I'm the one. Worth losing everything. I'm the one. And you're the one. And it's from that place of incredibly undeserved grace that we look around and we say, God, wow, you love me like that. How much more do you love others as well? And he invites us to join him in that pursuit so that heaven can continue to celebrate over our lives. We don't see a lot in the scriptures about when heaven celebrates, but I heard someone once ask me, is is heaven celebrating over your life? Yes, when you trust in Jesus, but what about the activity of your life after that? Because the category of celebration that we see in heaven is over more and more people coming to know the incredible love of God through our lives. So where you live, where you work, where you play, the simple invitation to love others well and have the boldness to share the good news when it's appropriate. And maybe it's in the room today where we say, God, I want that more. And I want to partner with others that are doing the same. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And then we're going to take some time to worship and to respond. Uh, And we're going to to pray over our friends here. But if you'll just take a moment and bow your heads with me. Let's pray together. This is just a moment of privacy for you and me to consider what God's speaking to us this morning. Some of you, you're like me. And you didn't know you were the lost sheep. You didn't even know God was looking for you. And this whole time, he's been looking for you. And maybe today is the day that you recognize God's love for you and you respond to it. You choose to trust in Jesus and follow him. And I want you to know with that decision, heaven celebrates and so do we. And we want to celebrate with you. And so if you have a desire to trust in Jesus today and follow him for the first time, we'd ask you to to let us know. Come to a prayer uh, team member in just a moment or let us know in that connection card so we can celebrate with you. Some of you, you have trusted in Jesus. You have been found. Your life has been made new and you've not taken the step of, of celebrating through baptism, of celebrating externally what Jesus has done in your heart internally, how he's changed you from the inside out. And your next step of obedience, like Kim K would say, to do the things that Jesus has told us to do would be to take a step of baptism, to be bold in that manner, to identify with Jesus publicly. If you've not taken that step since trusting in Jesus, you can let us know we'd love to celebrate with you in that manner. Others of you, you are followers of Jesus and the incredible love of God is just kind of worn cold. It's not as moving as it used to be. Maybe it's not as moving as it was on Thursday. And there's this fight in our hearts to keep the reality of the love of God for us alive, not because it has changed, because our hearts and minds are so easily distracted with lesser things. And maybe today it's just coming back and saying, thank you, God, for your love for me. Make it come alive in me again, fresh and new. And that might be a prayer you have to pray every day this week, multiple times a day to keep you back in the space of the reality of God's love for you. But it can't stop there. Maybe for some of you, you're like me and you're like, God, I I want to share this love with others. I want to be a disciple that makes disciples. I want to see Boulder, Colorado decrease in lostness. I want my friends and my neighbors and my coworkers to know your love. And I'm not trying to live on agenda. I want it to be authentic. I want it to be filled with power. I want it to be like, like MK was saying, that hearts are just changed. I can't do that, but you can. God, would you use me in that? Would you use me in that? The Holy Spirit just brought to mind something that MK didn't share, but as we sit and reflect, I want you to know many, many, many people are coming to faith in Jesus because of the simple obedience of normal people who have, who have been wrecked by the love of God. And a lot of them, they just simply pray for somebody and, and there's miraculous healings 
and there's all kinds of signs and answers to prayer, and people become convinced that, that Jesus is the one true God, much like when Minoj was healed and MK came to faith. That happens all the time. So maybe the simple prayer is, God, would you use me like that? I can't do it, but I would love to partner with you to see more and more disciples made. I'd love to use my own hands and baptize my friends and my neighbors and my coworkers. I'd love to be a part of that. Would you let my life be a life of multiplication? So Jesus, we, we're here today and, and we just say thank you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your goodness. Thank you for what you've done in our lives and what you are doing in our lives and what you will do in our lives. God, thank you for what you're doing in India. Wow. It's so big, it's hard to even imagine. And from the words of MK, it's so simple. It's not complicated at all. So God, would you help us to come back to the simple good news of Jesus and live, live in that way, receive it and love and live in that manner. God, we know that you have called us for a purpose here in Boulder, Colorado in 2024. Whether we're here for six months or six years or a lifetime, you've got plans and purposes for us here right now today. Make those plans come alive in us, Jesus. As we sing and as we respond, we ask for you to speak to us clearly, and we ask for the boldness to respond and do something about it. Amen.